Aka nui te mihi kia, kia tātou katoa, ko ai tēnā he uri tēnā no te rarawa, a me ki te tau toku pāpā no te rarawa, ki te tau toku māma no Ngāti Pāreha, a rā, ai rani me koti mana, ko māma re Stevens toku ingoa. Kia ora, kia ora tātou. Kia ora. Kia ora, well, I had the really happy experience of receiving this book and often when I receive a book, I'm lucky to receive them, but I open the first page and then I, I get tired. <laughs> <laughs> that did not happen with this book because of the, the pictures that um, kind of arrest, oh, excuse the pun, <laughs> that really wasn't planned. <laughs> that arrest me, um, but also the, the storytelling that, um, that is uh, throughout the pages here. Um, so thank you for um, providing us with such an engaging work. And I, I, I got a sense of, as you alluded to there in your kōrero, about this invitation into seeing, this, seeing the built environment around us with different eyes. And as you say, you know, this became a book about environment as much as a, of social history. What do we do with those new eyes? What do you want us to do with, you, you, you've put all this work into having us see Wellington differently and all whole swathes of our country. What do you want us to do with that? Um, that's a really good question. Um, and I'm glad you've asked it because I'm not one of those historians who will pretend to be objective and, and pretend that I'm neutral and that this is just a kind of academic um, exercise. Um, the work I write, the questions I ask, the narratives I tell are all intimately tied up with my politics and the kind of news and feelings and, and influences of the time. So this book came out of a place where I was um, learning a lot more about abolition politics and thinking about ways of dealing with harm and accountability that might not involve prisons. And I don't have that answer. And I, I, I'm still kind of learning that. And thankfully, there's some great organizations doing that work. But I think in order to think about power and to think about social change, we need to know what we're seeing and what we're talking about. and and to be able to name things in order to change them. So I really remember reading Jeff Park's Now Uta Order for the first time. Others read that amazing text and it just blew my mind about um, Pita Oni and all these places that I just frequented every day and could, new, could see in a new lens. And so I think having that knowledge and understanding as we walk through our spaces and we talk to others and we maybe think a little bit more about the role of prisons in Aotearoa in the past and also the present, I would hope that the book maybe inspires some critical thinking and some conversations. And I hope that as well as being a history text, it kind of lends itself to that, that bigger conversation, just one little voice in there as well. So It reminds me, I mean, not all building is destructive. So, for example, we've got the Living Par project up at Victoria University, and as a part of that project is the re, the uncovering, if you like, of the Kumu Toto stream, mm. which is a waterway that was very early on in its history kind of covered, and a lot of waterways are covered yes. in, in Wellington. And so to have that stream eventually be able to be seen um, and for that story again to be told, mm. so it, it strikes me that... You know, at the same time as you're inviting us to look at this environment with built, this built environment with different eyes, you're inviting us to into another level of story that isn't often told. I, there are lots of stories in here I had no idea about. You opened the book with a really powerful story. Did you want to mention that, or do you want that to be a? Dis <laughs> no, that's no, that's totally fine. So, coming back to that first question, I guess the way I write books is that um, I hope that the narrative and the storytelling will maybe bring in people who might not engage with the history or some of the ideas, you know, straight off the bat. Um, I think a lot of people still do believe that history is kind of this boring thing, and especially in New Zealand history, all the, all the exciting stuff happened overseas. Um, but we're, we're um, blessed with a really rich history 
Um, not all of that is pleasant history, yeah. um, but we need to know it. And so, yeah, I start the story um, as I do with some of the chapters. I try and follow a, a person or, or a narrative through. And um, the first person we meet in the book is um, Harry Brown, who's a prisoner. He's a former serviceman who served in the First World War. And he's in his 50s, and by the 1920s, he's basically um, what we'd call a vagrant today. And so he's arrested for being idle and disorderly, which is, that was actually going to be my next book after Dead Letters was Idle and Disorder, uh, Disorderly about vagrancy, and maybe I'll still write it, but I just love that, idle and disorderly. Um, <laughs> but he was, <laughs> yeah, he was arrested for basically being a vagrant and um, imprisoned, and he was sent up to... Um, the Terrace Jail, which is now Tauro School. And in the process of uh, pulling down the prison, he's buried under the earth and killed. And so I use his story to talk about how prison labour and um, the violence associated with it is just literally embedded under our feet. Um, so that's just one of many stories and many narratives where that labour is kind of congealed in the clay. And I, I kind of ask, why aren't, isn't there more knowledge about this? Mm. And why aren't there more monuments and plaques or apps, you know? And then I realised we'd just be littered with them because literally from Mount Ruapehu to the sea, um, prison labour's everywhere. And that was really eye-opening to me as well. Kia ora. Um, and, and, and stories jostle for attention too. Um, and... I noticed when you were rattling off the list of places in Wellington, I think you said it here, but it's certainly said in the book, that Tenakori Road, for example, is, was constructed as a result of, of prison labour. And of course, the name Tenakori, you know, no dinner, it's a Māori word, and it refers, and so there's a mixture there actually of prison labour and very early Māori waged labour. And my father used to say, that you know, Māori built this country. Mm. Māori built these roads, um, and of course, so those that story jostles for attention with the with the prison narrative. Yeah. What kind of decisions did you have to make about where you put your focus? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, like any author, a writer, a researcher, um, there are silences in the book. We we make decisions about what we focus on and what we don't. Um, I had to basically, and I, this is gonna sound like a bad pun, but I, I, I feel like I literally only scratched the surface here. I think there's so much more history to be written about prison labor and then weaving in some of those uh, longer stories. Um, it pops up in some places in the book um, when we're talking about Pukiahu. And, and the kind of pre-colonial history of that hill, which was then literally just leveled away through successive waves of, of prison labor. Um, and then in terms of uh, through the Tongariro Central Plateau, I kind of weave in some of the stories there because um, the state decided to plonk down some prisons on some pretty important sacred wahitapu yeah. there and also in the Waikato. So, some of those histories aren't mine to tell as a Pākehā researcher, but I think as Pākehā we do have a responsibility and a role to educate ourselves. Um, so there are some things in there, but you're right, for sure, you have to make decisions and um, there's a lot more that still could be said, I think. Yeah, I actually really loved that way in Chapter 7, how you return to a story of the land that uh, you cannot see because of the kind of imposition of the of the prison farm in Tongariro in that, mm. in that in that particular area, and you do that, do that really beautifully. Um, and uh, there's also another um, a chapter where you talk about the um, the Māori prisoner experience, because of course, in most of the time that you're writing, there are very few Māori prisoners. But the exception to this was during the New Zealand wars. That's right, and. Um, one of the areas that I've taught at, at Vic is at um, Te Waka is in social security law. And there's this story about, I'm getting to the point, honest. There's this story uh, about um, kind of welfare in, 
in England in the 19th century and the hulks, mm. you know, where, where, where there'd be these rotting kind of carcasses of ships that people would have to go and live in, um, either as prison hulks or as um, other kind of hulks. And I'd never realised that there was the prison hulks that, that were used here in Aotearoa as well. And one of those hulks, at least one of them, was used to house Māori prisoners um, as a result of the New Zealand wars before being shipped off, literally, to the Chatham, uh, to the Chathams? Yeah. And um, Otago. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, then there was a prison hulk moored just off Kaiwharawhara uh, of Māori prisoners um, who basically tried to break out in 1866 in a mm. storm much like tonight and managed to kind of swim across and escape up into Nauranga Gorge and, and some died in the process. And mm. talking about looking at the landscapes now, now I'm just on the train into work, I kind of go past that spot every day. And it's it's like that with so many um, stories in this book. But yeah, you're right, Māori were imprisoned on hulks mm. um, here in Wellington. Um, in Auckland and then shift off to Kawai Island and of course we should know the story of the prisoners sent to the Chatham Islands and Te Kōti coming back um, and then after that time they decided to actually make use of Māori captive labour and that's when you start to get Māori being sent to Dunedin, to Hokitika, to um, Littleton and, and various places to, to do that work. Mm, yeah. Elder. And so th as much as this is a story about the built environment, there is, a, there is deep social history here. And there's a couple of points where, um, where your writing addresses uh, kind of the constructed criminal, you know, the idea of the, of the, the criminal at the heart of um, our theories and our thinking about punishment and about wrongdoing and all the rest of it. Um, and so you're kind of pulling, you, you, you're pulling away some of the layers to see the people at the heart of that, of that presumption. Um, did anything about, what surprised you about the people that you found yourself writing about? Yeah, um, I think like most of us, when we think of criminal, we think of kind of hard crime and you know, socialise into us to have a particular type of person when we think about that. In the 19th century, I found that the people going in and out of prison, um, it was really blurry. You could, could be a working class labourer or a, a worker on the street and then end up in jail for drunkenness, which was by far the highest crime in the 19th century, um, followed secondly by vagrancy. So these kind of social disorder crimes, especially with women as well, it was kind of they didn't like Bolf Street women <coughs> quiet and being their place. <coughs> um, and so you had people in and out. So part of the argument of the book is that we shouldn't see um, free and unfree labour as these kind of binary separate worlds. It was a lot more fluid. Um, coercion had a role in the 19th century and still has a role on all sorts of working lives. So it was interesting to learn more about that. And I don't want to dismiss that there were, you know, um, horrid crimes committed mm. by prisoners. Um, but depending on the period, it, it was really often social crimes that the colony did not like. And one of the other things that I had no idea about was just the extent of how many prisoners were um, overseas sailors, seamen who were working the ships. I mean, by the 1860s, the population of those on board ships coming to Aotearoa was about half a million. And so those sailors had very particular legal instruments that dictated their working terms. So if they mutinied on board or helped themselves to the cargo, you know, perks, um, or, or tried to better their working conditions, they were thrown in jail for 90 days and then when the ship was ready to sail again, they picked them out of prison and sent them back on board. So there's this really fluid motion of, of um, working class people ending up in prison. Mm -hmm. And I have a chapter on the Pacific as well because I wanted to really follow the call of those indigenous scholars who've asked us to extend New Zealand into the Pacific. Um, and seeing the kind of charges as that the Cook Islanders and the Samoan um, Islanders were being sent in and out of jail for, for the just m most minute things mm -hmm. that really did change my perspective of the criminal and, and how crime is defined by the state.
Yeah, and I'd imagine that as you were writing, the you, you're getting the sense of the construction of the the um, so the settler criminal will be different to the construction of the Maori kind of rebellious war criminal, um, which is different again to the construction of the of, of the criminal in the islands. And the perp we, we talk like I. I teach a bit of criminal law as well, and we talk about the goals of punishment, mm. you know, rehabilitation, retribution, um, deterrence, things like that. But none of those goals are being met. Uh, instead, there's social goals about social control mm. and about constructing a national narrative as well, would you mm. say? Yeah, and I mean, one of the things that I was really surprised by, and this was that link between the social and the environmental, which I don't think you can separate, by the way. Um, although I have to learn a lot more environmental history, people will read in the book how, how, how they're intricately um, connected. But um, yeah, the, the, the kind of idea of idleness really popped up mm. in this book and, and the state being so uh, worried about waste and all this idle labour behind the jail's walls and, and those on the street who weren't working because they were idle and then that extended into idle landscapes and yeah. so-called wasted lands that yeah. Māori land that was sitting yeah. fallow and needed to be improved. Um, so that idea of improvement um, really came through in the, in the book and the research and that I guess led me to think a bit deeper about work and idleness and yeah. idle and disorderly back to that again <laughs> and of course a big companion piece or a companion through through the book is capitalism and notions of capitalism and um, labor and if you like the construction of the ideal worker and what a worker really should be doing and what a worker um, um, how a workers labor should be should be used did you it, there's a times through the book where I feel a sense of urgency and anger. Was I correct in picking that up? Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> um, it surprises me that labour historians haven't looked to prisoners as a working class formation. Mm. They weren't just of the working class, they were a working class formation. The chain gang were just like any other group of navvy any other seaman, any other farm labourer. They had their own subculture, they had their own working rituals. Um, some of that was obviously forced on them. Um, and so, yeah, I think wasn't necessarily so much anger, but um, just wanting to bring them into the picture. Like, I was really surprised. There's this idea that for a certain amount of time in Aotearoa, we were the working man's paradise, right? It was a land without strikes. But prisoners are striking in 1904, mm. 1905, 1906. They're striking well ahead of all the labour movement. But labour historians haven't picked that up because they haven't looked at prisoners as a working class formation. So, yeah, I wanted to bring that in. But, yeah, I, I mean, I think when you realise that so much of our landscape is based on violence and coercion, that does bring up some anger and some questions of it, like, why didn't I learn this? And... Mm. Um, yeah, why didn't I know? And I, maybe it was just the right time to ask those questions. I mean, I don't, don't want to claim that I'm the first to do this. Other scholars have looked at prisons and they've looked at prison labour and, and quite a lot of, um, you know, one-off reports. And some of those historians are here tonight and I'm really thankful for their work. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to bring it together into kind of a cohesive narrative mm. um, and, and just bring that kind of working class life back into the picture and, and also just to talk openly about capitalism as well because I don't think we do it enough. Kilda. And there's certainly a trajectory when you look at the, the, the chapters in the book. I didn't, you know, improvement, heavy metal, industry, war, plantation, empire, prison land. Do you want to just take us through what you imagine that trajectory is? Yeah, uh, the book's partly... Um, by chronology and time base, but I also base it on what Thomas G. Andrews calls workscapes. So these spaces where the kind of boundaries between social and environment just kind of blur and get messy. And so that's the bedrock of the book. And so starting with the idea of improvement, 
from agrarian capitalism in the 1500s, the ideas of prisons and where they came through, and then kind of taking us through the roads, the public works and the, the forts and the, the forests, um, and then through to the Pacific, and then finally back around to imprison, um, imprisonment and the, the prison farms. And Samuel Marsden, when he came here in 1814, had this idea of improving Māori and improving their society and improving the landscape through, the, through work. Yeah. And he, he said to the missionaries and their convicts, if, if you uh, fall into idleness, it will be your ruin. And you see that right through back into Waikiria prison when it's opening in 1910. They're talking about the very same things and in fact they're still talking about the very same things and still getting prisoners to repair Waikiria after the uprising a couple of years back so that's the thread that goes through that idea of improvement idleness and work mm, mm, mm. Mm. and there's something supposedly therapeutic I guess about the nature the idea of work back in Marsden's time and even today this idea that work in prison is somehow going to improve you as a person. Yeah, Kelda. Um, uh, this probably sounds like a cheap question, but um, why, why is it that we did not end up a penal colony in the same way that, and, and I'm assuming that part of the answer to that is to set us your waitangi. So um, in your researches, was that what you were expecting to find, that we, that, the, that there was a, a, a particular difference and that that's part of the reason? Yeah, so um, this is a complex topic and people <laughs> yes, should look at sorry. Neil Fletcher's <laughs> new book. Uh, <laughs> but um, basically there was a whole lot of thinking going on at the time and actually William Hobson, when he was about to ship over from Sydney, begged the colonial office to bring convicts with him. He wrote, there's just no way he'd be able to build roads in Auckland and wherever he was coming if he didn't have convict labour. He really wanted convicts from Sydney. And the colonial office kind of said, no, 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 we will not have that. Um, the, the cost would be too high. And I'm not sure if that's like the, the moral cost or whether it was just going to be too expensive to set it up as a penal colony because Australia was really expensive at the time. And um, so that, that, dictation, I guess, from the colonial office sort of shaped mm. what happened because from that point on, Hobson and the other authorities of the Fledging Connolly colony, sorry, had to basically make use of the labour that they had to hand and that happened to be prisoners. Um, they did bring over some prisoners during the Northern War, um, around 1845 from Sydney. Um, and actually New Zealand did become a penal colony for Pacific Islanders, especially the Samoan Mao independence movement. Um, prisoners were shipped from Samoa, from the Cook Islands, to Aotearoa to work on these prison farms and things. Mm. But generally, that, that kind of thread just before 1840 and then Te Tiriti did shape the... the the, the, the role of prison labour here, but they, some people really wanted it to be like Britain and have basically people doing repetitive hard labour in the jail with no outcome whatsoever, just to, just to punish them. But actually, it seemed like waste and idle labour behind the prison walls was more criminal than crime itself. So they really wanted to put people to work um, just because of that labour shortage. Mm. I'm sensing we're probably coming to the end of our Q&A time here, but one final question from me. Um, you've written a lot about the unfree. What did you learn about freedom as a result of writing this book? Freedom's such... Uh, I, freedom's a strange word now, um, after the parliamentary sure protests. It is. <laughs> um, and I don't know if I should have brought that up or not, but... Um, <laughs> And, Sorry, and, it's and my it, fault. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's confusing having been, you know, in various um, social movements for a long time, then to see that word kind of co opted and used in different ways. But what I learned was that all of our working lives in the past and even today are shaped by some form of coercion. And I think the book, hopefully, for people, will um, bring out some of that continuum and maybe 
question a little bit about whether we really can split off free from unfree, or whether we really can split off the, the prison wall from the rest of our, our society, or whether we can kind of hide prisons off mm -hmm. behind the fence and behind the trees. And so what I learned about freedom, I think, um, yeah, that coercion, unfortunately, is very present in our past and in our present. Kia ora. Thank you.